a pretty radical uh, right-wing town anyway. So a lot of the children of these engineers that had been hired to work at Marine Industries went back to their home countries to go to school. And I was really lucky because I'd had a, uh, I'd earned, I came from a really working class family, but I had won a scholarship to go to Christ Hospital School in uh, Sussex. So I went back to attend that. Didn't last for very long because my dad yanked me out back to Canada after very, fairly quickly. But I was exposed to art history, that's the sort of thing. Uh, at the age of 11. And I absolutely, as a kid, loved art history. And um, the school had like Saturday classes where we would go up and we even had, this is gonna be quite name droppy, uh, so forgive me in advance about this, but uh, Kenneth Clark was our Saturday morning instructor. Um, so, kids would sign up because it was a boarding school. The kids would sign up for what they wanted to do on the weekends. And since I was into art history, we would go to the Tate Gallery with Kenneth Clark and everything. And he was at that point, you know, really famous. He was, he'd been the director. Of, I'm not quite sure about the timing with the director of ship of the Courtauld Institute, but he was a big wig in the National Gallery. And he was a brilliant guy, just stuffy as hell when you look at him now, but he was such a revolution as a teacher. And so that inspired me. Then we, so I came back, came back to Canada. My parents had moved at this point uh, in close to Montreal. And dad was actually working, just a little sidebar. I've had some interesting connections. Dad worked on the Pratt & Whitney aircraft on that plane that was later dumped. You know, the, the uh, was it the Arrow? Oh, Arrow, yes. Yeah, that, so he, you know, and it's only recently, you know, you start putting things together and realize you know, there's a real Canadian saga here. So dad was working that and I went to high school. Um, there was no art classes. And then of course, when it came to university time, um, I was part of that generation where, um, you know, I had to go to work. Um, I, my parents hadn't accumulated the money to send me to university. So most of my school friends went off to, to a university. I got a job. So like loads of people, I had jobs in odd things, working in banks and stuff like that. And uh, then I ended up working for CIL. And uh, most of you are going to be a lot younger than me, obviously. So um, it was a quite paternalistic period. And I mean that in a really good way. But CIL had a policy with all of its employees that if you wanted to take university courses, they would pay for them continuously as long as you passed. Um, and so I, myself and a whole lot of other students started you know, going over to taking evening classes and I ended up earning several degrees. And one of them uh, being uh, the major was in art history. So that's the really important, that was the key that took me through was not wanting to be a painter was this fascination with art history and studying that. And I, it got some great opportunities. In 1967, CIL was one of the sponsors at the World's Fair. And um, those of you who've visited Montreal will know that old Montreal is a real tourist attraction now. In 1965-66, it was a dump. There was hardly any. Most of the people who lived there were rubbies. Um, and it was a fairly desolate place but I loved going down there sketching. And um, then over the couple of years where I was going down there sketching, I noticed that some brave souls opened up restaurants and things. There had always been a few um, classy residents. Um, the most noticeable were the nuns, the Congregation de Notre Dame who lived in next to the chapel of Notre Dame de Bon Secours. They were highly educated women. And just on the same street with their chapel was a music critic for the, I think the Gazette. Um, and he had restored Louis Joseph Papineau's house. And it was from that nucleus of the nuns, Louis Joseph Papineau, and then the uh, expo beginning to take place. But that whole area uh, went through a major metamorphosis. Ogilvy's department store bought a corner a house right near the chapel 
and restored it. It's still a great landmark. And CIL uh, bought a, and you could buy a house for a dollar in old Montreal, as long as you restored it. So 1965, you could buy a genuine 17th century house. Um, and CIL bought this place for a buck. Um, I was, they did hire a curator and it was gonna house CIL's armaments museum during the centennial. So I became a really, there's a, a guy who's uh, hired as the curator of the gun collection, who's same age as myself. And uh, he was hired specifically to do that. I had a regular desk job at CIL, but they would forward me down there. And I would go down there sketching. So this gets to the beginning of my career. I would go out sketching uh, these buildings and one of the VPs in the company saw one of my drawings. They commissioned me to do a drawing of the house they'd purchased and it became the corporate Christmas card. Then they started asking me to look after some cultural things because they had a really good art collection and it was used for PR gestures and it traveled all over North America. And um, I didn't look bad when I had a shirt and tie on. So they would send me out accompanying and I got to go to the minor places, you know, like town libraries where it was sent to. And um, the, the vice presidents would accompany it to the really prestigious locations. But anyway, I did put the map together. Um, I researched a map of old Montreal with a walk, a suggested walking tour researched um, all the individual buildings. And there were things there like, you know, uh, James McGill's property, McTavish, the great fur trader's house and stuff like that, which were still unrestored, but I just would identify where they were. And it was just fabulous being able to go down there and do that. And I was paid to do that. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that led to a whole lot of other stuff. So that was my background. It was basically just drawing and from a history point of view. And then um, CIL um, got me a, an exhibition in a gallery that was being created in old Montreal. So I had my first solo exhibition before I was an artist. Um, they were just my pencil drawings. Um, there were, I think, about 24 of them. And I will tell you this, my mum bought half the show, you know, <laughs> again, you know. From, uh, uh, so I was in my, yes, I was just in my mid twenties mm -hmm. and, and I had an exhibition under my belt. Um, and somebody said, you know, your drawings are really nice. It would be great if they had some color in them. That's how I started becoming an artist. Um, you know, <laughs> I, um, and then in 1968, Having graduated on uh, really from all the bachelor level courses I was interested in taking, I um, thought, you know, it's time to perhaps look around for a real job. So I, I looked into teaching and it was at that whole time when Quebec was going through a revolution. And although I'd been raised pretty much in Quebec, I um, inquiring into becoming a teacher, uh, I realized I was gonna have to go to McDonald College and it was gonna cost me quite a bit of money to go there full time. And uh, also there was the beginning of writing on the wall for Anglophone education. So I sent a letter to, to Ontario to check into that. And that's when I got a, instead of having to pay money, Ontario gave me, I think several thousand dollars to come down, got me a place at U of T. And I thought, well, I'll try teaching for a few years. And, I, and I, I love this story, somebody. So I was thinking, you know, when I thought, well, I'll try teaching, I'll become a history teacher. My role model being Mr. Chips. I thought I was gonna be, you know, <laughs> uh, if, I think you're all familiar with that story, a charming story. I, I naively thought, yeah, teaching was gonna be like Mr. Chips personified. Um, but I remember going into the Faculty of Education at U of T. And it's one of those moments that changed my life. Um, this very presentable, charming little old lady who was at the registration desk gave me the forms, asked me to fill them in. She said, what do you want to teach? And um, I, I said, well, history. And she said, well, you've got to have a second option. And I said, well, I guess perhaps English. And it was so funny because she responded with a major expletive. And she said, do you want to... <clears throat> 
job. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. And she said, well, English and history would be a, you know, blah, blah, I won't go the words, um, awful choice because she'd just be marking all the time. And um, I said, well, I have a degree <laughs> in art. So she just filled in the form, said, fine, you're gonna be a history and an art teacher. So that was the beginning of my career, taken out of my hands by somebody else. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it worked. Uh, I ended up slowly switching from history into teaching art. Uh, one of the people that's gonna be joining us, Kim Atkins, Kim is uh, with us. Oh, she is with us now. Okay. Yeah. Kim, um, I met what, as a teacher because, and I think this is really important, you've got to have some nurturing. And uh, we all worked for what was then the Scarborough Board of Education. And uh, the Scarborough Board of Education had an arts coordinator, Bill Stadnick, who was a bit of a rogue, a lovable sort of a rogue in a way. But he, um, ensured that the arts were taken very seriously. And he bragged that at one point, um, every art head in the Scarborough school system, and it was an extensive school system, was an exhibiting artist. And so I became part of that community. I mean, very different from most places. And um, so Kim, I met Kim there. She was an art head in another school. I did switch schools and became an art head and met a great group of people. And there's, I'm jumping ahead of a bit, but four of those art heads became a team, uh, my painting buddies. And they have really dragged me along um, and uh, made me into more of an artist than I certainly was when I entered education. Um, At that time, were you aware, aware of other artists like Robert Bateman who were teachers as well and, and well yeah I mean because he's always been a big star on the scene right and everything and um but uh I just never pictured myself being part of all that the I you know I I ended up being a, a fairly effective teacher and I really and I don't mean that again being arrogant or anything but um I've got to stop looking down here and look out at you people sorry but um the um the turning point was in the late 1970s, I, yeah, the late 1970s, 70s, um, I was working with another chap uh, who was my boss in this first school. He was a very um, intuitive watercolor painter and he would take my drawings and suggest I do things. So I slowly learned watercolor painting from this chap. And then what happened, he was aware of the uh, outside art community. He was a, a, a Torontonian by training. So he had knew all the people that came out of Danforth Tech and all those places or taught there, Fred Savard and those people. Anyway, one year he said to me, you know, why don't you submit some of your paintings to the Watercolor Society? Well, I didn't even know what a Watercolor Society was. Anyway, he was gonna take some down and he took two of mine down along with his. And it was the best thing that happened. And it was the worst thing that could have happened because he got rejected and I had both my paintings accepted. And then to rub the salt into the wounds, I won a major prize. And in those days with the rules of, the, it was the CSPWC, the Canadian Society of Paintings and Watercolor. If you got into two of their annual shows, no, if you got two works into their annual shows, uh, you could you qualified to become a member. And I did it with the first step. I had two works accepted and so I was in and I, I didn't even realize how significant that was at the time. Um, can, we pause for, I joined. Sorry? can we pause for a moment and, and yeah. give everyone an idea of what art societies were like at that time? Um, this is the Watercolor Society. Were there other societies around that you were aware of? Yeah, I've, I've got some notes here and uh, we can, you can invite um, Linda in and Kim at the point. They, but this is one of the things, talking with Alan, we thought would be a, a perhaps some interest. is just going over what the major societies are in Canada. Um, overriding them all in terms of history and prestige. 
is undoubtedly the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts. Um, the Royal Canadian Academy uh, was founded around the time of Confederation when the Marquis of Lorne was the governor general. And he of course came as part of a very prestigious package. Those of you who are into Canadian history, the Marquis of Lorne, who later in life became the Duke of Argyle, was married to Princess Louise, the artistic daughter of Queen Victoria. And they lived in the Ottawa at the time. And he thought that Canada needed some of the institutions, you know, their own branches, but the institutions that already existed in Great Britain. And one of the things he wanted to do was set up an, an academy. His wife got the nomenclature of it being the Royal Canadian Academy. And uh, he selected the artists. And what is really important is the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts from its very founding and having a royal connection had the most prestige. Um, and the artists that assembled had to put up, put together an arts education program and under the tutelage of the governor general, they opened up the first art gallery in Ottawa and they became the founders of the National Gallery. And so with that, all their artists as they were elected traditionally, one of their pieces was selected to go into the collection of the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts. And I'd like to come back to that. So the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts, which if you're elected, um, gives you the initials RCA, is the most prestigious theoretically. Historically, Kim, I'm gonna ask you to jump in here if you can on this. Historically, the Ontario Society of Artists is the oldest art society in Canada. It predates Confederation, um, but by its very name, it's not na national in its scope. Um, do you want, are you there, Kim? Yeah, I'm just asking Kim to unmute if she can. Okay. There she is. I just unmuted it. The, the, there were a number, as you know, a number of people who were interested in art in the province and they got together and they had a sort of similar history in a way because they um, were instrumental in the very beginning in promoting the arts. And so they created what is now the Ontario College of Arts and Design, OCAD, that they founded OCAD. And they also created the Art Gallery of, of Canada, sorry, the Art Gallery of Toronto, which is now the AGO. So the, the history um, goes back in, in the same sense to the Royal Academy, about the same time, there's certain parallels. Our um, founding, they became organized in 1872. So we're waiting for our 150th anniversary in 2022. Yeah, and, um, and you're certainly one of the most, you know, probably the most prestigious initials, I think, in reality to have after your name today. How do you mean? I, well, I, haven't, I haven't been knighted. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think just having, you know, uh, you know for, for the people watching who don't know about all these things, I think the OSA is the group that is most meaningful. And, um, and uh, there, anyway, I'm gonna go through some of the others and then sure. come back to this, okay? Um, sure, cool. So the uh, so you've got the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts, the Ontario Society of Artists, um, the Society of Canadian Artists, which is the SCA. Um, is Linda Kemp available? Because she's a member of that. Yes, I am. Hi, Tony. Hi, dear. You're a member of the SCA, aren't you? Yes, I am. And you want to? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to just talk a bit about the SCA? I, I'm is sorry, it? I'm not an authority on it. I know it's a much younger group, um, yeah. but uh, uh, honestly, I'm not not enough information to give you to, to help you out oh, with that. Oh, okay, because I, I, I don't know much either, and I just thought um, you might know more than I do. Ladies, yeah. Kemp, if everybody knows, the lady on the screen that I'm talking to is Linda <laughs> Kemp. Uh, she's one of my... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so she's a well-known writer of several major art books, and she is um, 
Kim is who you just met is one of my art buddies as the four of us who were former teachers. Linda, I met when I jo through joining the CSPWC and we were part of a group of radicals when we were first <laughs> active in that group. Um, but yeah. those, those, the Society of Canadian Artists is another one that people should consider. You know, so if you're a painter and, and we're gonna cover that, why join these societies? The SCA has a really good exhibition record today. I mean, they do quite a lot of stuff. They've got a very keen executive. I do know that. Yes. And the OSA has got a very keen group. And Kim was responsible for some of the rejuvenation of that. Um, so anyway, so we've got the Royal Canadian Academy, the Ontario Society of Artists, the Society of Canadian Artists. And then there's the Federation, which is why we're all here tonight. Um, the Federation, and I'm... Uh, speaking to something you already know, was basically until fairly recently a Western group. And I can remember some years ago, I spoke to Linda and I said, do you think it's worth me keeping my membership in the FC as, as an SFCA? And you said to me from all your teaching and stuff going out on these units, you said, no, that's, a, that's an important set of initials to keep after your name if you're you know, dealing with the West. So there's the Federation. And then the fourth group I just want to come to, which is where I met Linda, is the Canadian Society of Painters in Watercolor. Uh, so anybody listening in who's a watercolorist, um, this is going to be confusing. There are actually two watercolor societies. And what this, these societies have over the RCA, the OSA, the SCA, and the FCA is that it's a society, their society is built around one medium. And I think that makes a real difference. Um, and as I said, I was elected into the Canadian, that's where I won, I got placed and won that award in 1980. Um, and I have constantly heard over the years, and I think Linda can verify this, when we used to have get togethers, annual meetings, unlike tonight's uh, uh, meetings where these were people, where real people gathered and we would elect new members. Constantly we heard the members of the CSBW scene saying it was their favorite society. And I think the reason was that we all shared the same medium. We all dealt with watercolors and the issues and the problems of dealing with watercolors. And that's something the other societies just do not have by their very nature. Um, and I just want to, I think what I'd like to just do is take this off of the specific societies. I did think we were doing a service and just bringing those various societies to everybody's attention because a lot of artists do end up with more than one affiliation and some of them are worth, and, and that's why I wanted Linda and Kim to be here to comment on, which were the ones that are worth going after and which were the ones that aren't? And I, Kim, I see a malicious smile coming on your face, but the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts of all of them seems to be the least worthwhile to join. It is definitely the most prestigious set of initials. I have no denying that, but they never seem to do anything. And, and could I add, Tony, too, that they cover a whole range of arts, not just the visual arts. Oh, yeah, they, they're now architecture, boat building. Yeah, all, you know, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and as, Tony, if we could step back a moment, too. I guess some of the reasons these societies came about was that artists didn't have access to a commercial gallery or galleries. If I guess there's a time when they didn't exist. So the only way you could have your work scene yeah. was to join a society is that correct yeah oh no definitely um i was yeah i've, I've got some notes on this uh, if you take like the royal canadian academy of the arts and the os the yeah the osa they used to have several annual shows the osas would be at the art gallery of toronto the royal canadian academy were in, in what became the national gallery and that was where you know, the elite of Canada would go and see these art exhibitions and buy the work that was, you know, being displayed. Um, that was the only way people could market their work. 
And the other thing too, was that you could successfully market because you were hanging with other famous names. You weren't in some little tiny shop front or something like that, because there were art businesses that existed in Canada, usually linked to auction houses. But you know, they were auction houses that were selling off estates and houses and mm -hmm. farm equipment and all sorts of stuff. And every so often they'd have paintings. But you know, definitely the academies were set up to market artists. Um, and that was even true still when I joined the CSPWC in the 1980s. Um, uh, but a change was taking place. The gallery scene, the commercial gallery scene was beginning to intrude because there was obviously a lot of money to make in that. I mean, the Roberts Gallery in Toronto predates that. It's one of the oldest. And do you know, I have skipped over because there's just so much information here. There, has, there were a lot of societies in the 19th century, early 20th century that grew up in Montreal around the um, Montreal Art Association. And they, an offshoot of that group, founded the Musée des Beaux-Arts. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where Bremner and some of the old historic artists centered and marketed their work through the gallery scene there. So I don't want to give the illusion that Toronto was important at the turn of the century. It really wasn't the turn of the, 19th, the 20th century. It was Montreal and Ottawa. Then it slowly became Ottawa and Toronto. And now, of course, it's uh, the West is also in there. But no, it was a major thing. Um, and the other important thing I was trying to think so we didn't get bogged down here is that it was, these were not only marketing ventures, they were places where you, they, these artists could gather and talk art to, to their peer group. Um, uh, but the other thing is too, that they had a role in controlling the art business in the country. And that artist is totally lost at this point. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the societies have been uh, the losers, I guess, is the only way of putting it, because a new career path opened up and you ended up with the curatorial people step coming in. And I can, that was part of the tradition that I witnessed with the study of art history, which we think, you know, people have been studying art history forever, but no, that really started in the early 20th century. Um, and, you know, certainly when you've got in the English world, the Courtauld Institute set up in London. Um, and that brings in your spy, Alan, and all those people. Yes. Um, yeah, and that became a major force. And I can remember when I was first going to university in the 60s, that you ended up with, um, you know, art history courses right. being available. And um, yeah, and so and then what happened out of those art history courses, you end up with courses in restoration, conservation, all that stuff being offered. And slowly those disciplines become major professional choices. And there is no doubt today that the whole art scene is controlled by curators and their ilk, and definitely not the art community. Oh. I wondered about that too, uh, Tony, with corporate art collections and who who buys art for the banks and insurance companies and because I've certainly seen what you're describing too at that level um, oh yeah no and the um no I mean we we have totally and Kim you experience this I think uh, of hearing a story just from the last couple of years that officially the societies um are no longer to be spoken to by the art establishment. Isn't that like variations on that from uh, the AP? I think things are, are changing really quickly. And my own experience would just say, um, this group probably that I'm involved with went from being a group of painters to people now who are doing digital art and installation and photography and selling their work online, um, independent of perhaps exhibitions that we're putting together. Right. Uh, we have had one show for the last 147 years, which is, you know, a, a triumph for the group, I think. But 
it's hard to say what's going to happen, how these things are going to move forward. We're, we're at a point now where a number of galleries are closing um, mm -hmm. and there are fewer large galleries where people, you know, independent galleries where artists can show their work. People are putting together collectives, I think. Yeah, no, there's no doubt, yeah. And, and Tony, I think this might, be a, this might be a good point to uh, move towards um, how the Royal Collection came about, because I know you tell the story about having a collection of watercolor paintings that were cur curated, but right. you couldn't find a gallery that would be willing to, to exhibit them. Yep, no, for sure. You know, just if you wouldn't mind, I, sure. I, let's move in that. But one of the things I, ju I just had a, a list here that I made up today of why anybody would even want to be in a society today. What are the advantages of a society? So I, I, I've already touched on this. I think it's the, the whole idea of camaraderie, which is really a strong thing. Uh, and as I say, especially in the single media societies, um, generally, uh, a lot of the societies offer awards and things and for artists to submit, uh, winning one of those prizes and awards, obviously, is a great bio entry. Um, and, and the, you know, certainly with the CSPWC the, uh, and this Royal Collection project that you've asked me to bring up, um, that is an opening opportunity for people that they would never ever have uh, in a solitary art career or through a commercial gallery. Um, and um, I, I do think there are, that's something people have to explore for themselves. But um, anyway, um, to go on to the Royal Collection project uh, there, which is a, has been a major draw for the society. It started um, in the 1980s when I was first elected into society and they were so starved for workers that I went from being a new member and the next day I was on the executive board. You know, that's how it tends to work in the art community. If you can breathe, you know, you can become a vice president or something. Um, but what happened, there was a wonderful, wonderful man, a former president of the society, Bill Sherman, who thought that with, for the looming 60th anniversary of the society, that they should put together a collection of 60 watercolors and jury them, uh, not, well, jury all the submissions, but cults, select 60 and then place them in a public institution as a memorial to this diamond jubilee. So I submitted a painting and I was lucky to be one of the 60 that were selected and um, Bill asked me, and I realized afterwards he was plotting all along. Once they were juried, he asked me to keep them under my bed. And um, then we would look for a home. And for two years, Bill and I were looking for a home for 60 Canadian watercolors by contemporary artists. And I just to, so that is gonna be what I'm gonna to stick to, but uh, just to digress, there were some major, incredibly moving, li almost life altering moments with putting those works together. Um, because one of them, and I'll just give you one example. I got a, a watercolor had been juried in by Peter Howarth, who was an official war artist and principal of the Ontario College of Art. And I called him because the back had some tape on it and I thought it could end up being a conservation issue. And so I called him and he said, well, come on down and you can just select you know, an alternative. And I went down here, they, they, he and his wife, um, Bob's Cogglehoweth, lived in this enormous house in Rosedale, not very far from Rosedale subway station, you know, a walk into that rather exotic part of town. And they pulled out all these folders from underneath staircases and from behind furniture. One folder was just full of war art. And we went through them and we, you know, so between us, we selected a better painting from both of them. 
and put it in. They went, his was not technically a watercolor, but that didn't matter. It was wonderful. And then when we were packing it away, he asked me if I would like the war portfolio. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, it was that little honorable wasp side of me at the time, you know, I said, well, I can't, you know, I was there on behalf of the Watercolor Society. And I said, no, I can't do that. And I've regretted it every day since because, you know, uh, I have no idea what happened to that stuff. And from that period, right after, you know, and that was in that period when none of this stuff was appreciated. It was, pr I probably, it was all destroyed, you know, mm. when they died. And uh, anyway, no, so there was some amazing moments. So anyway, what we did do was we, uh, uh, with the 60 paintings under my bed, and they were all Smith quarter sheet sizes and matted, uh, I recontacted everybody that Bill had contacted before when he was getting these refusals. And so this is rather damning of Canada at the time, but I contacted Rideau Hall, all the major art galleries, the Royal Ontario Museum, all the major university galleries, so Hart House, for example, and every one of them either declined or didn't bother to respond. Even Rideau Hall, where I remember making a very careful pitch saying that I knew they didn't have a gallery, but the 60 watercolors could go in a portfolio to be in the library, you know, with the Governor General's Literary Award winners. And they couldn't even be, so I even phoned them and said, you know, I, I think my a letter I sent you went astray. And um, they, the woman who answered the phone said, oh yes, I remember that coming in. Um, but, you know, she put me to somebody else and they just, you know, no, screwed you around and it was all a big blur, you know, it was really rather shattering. So anyway, these 60 paintings were under my bed. One of, some of the groups did say they didn't want them because the, the artists had juried them. They thought, the curatorial staff of the receiving gallery should be the people who juried them. So I, I can see some validity in that, but it wasn't, you know, the Winnipeg Gallery's collection of Canadian watercolors, it was the CSPD, CSPWC's collection. So why shouldn't we jury them? Anyway, the, the exciting part of the story is my partner and I, middle this, went off to Fiji, changed planes in Vancouver, went to WH Smith's, that, dates the story, uh, saw a book on the Royal Collection um, that I purchased to read on what was gonna be a long flight. And um, as I was reading this book, and it was a history of the Royal Collection by Monarch. Um, and the first thing I did in Vancouver was ripped off the covers, read a few chapters while I was waiting for the next flight ripped them off as I was going through, you know, the ages, the Plantagenets and the Tudors and everything, put it in the garbage. So it was lightening it. And then got to Fiji and I was reading the last part, which was of course on the Windsors and their art collecting habits. And what, and this is the key to the story, the bibliography and the index was still attached to the back. And when I looked into it, Prince Philip had received a large portfolio of work from the Australian Royal Academy. There were lots of references to art from India because of the looting and everything that went on there. There were only two references to Canada. Uh, there were two paintings that Queen Victoria had been, had been gifted from Canada. One was of a, it's a famous lost painting actually, an interesting little footnote in Canadian history. We had a prime minister who died in Windsor Castle. Um, and there was a painting of him with Queen Victoria lying a wreath at his coffin. Um, but anyway, that's disappeared. Nobody knows where that painting has gone, but it's still officially listed in their collection. Anyway, I wrote a letter to the author of the book. His name was Sir Robin Mackworth Young, and just said, you know, I've read the book and there's a noticeable absence of Canadian art, and yet we are the senior dominion in the Commonwealth. And, you know, I think we have a solution for you. And uh, I said, you know, these 60 paintings have already been pre-juried. Is there any chance? I said, and I admitted, I said, I cannot speak on behalf of the society because I didn't go into this, but everybody was presuming these paintings were going to stay in Canada, uh, that, that the Queen would accept them. Anyway, I wrote a very 
sooty letter using all the term royal terminology. I'm quite good at writing letters and I don't confuse your royal highness with your majesty at the appropriate times and stuff like that. That's a part of my limey birth. Anyway, um, I wrote a letter in Fiji, mailed it to Sir Robin Mackworth Young, the keeper of the Queen's pictures at Windsor Castle. And a couple of weeks later, I got home and there's noticeably in the mail, this impressive envelope with a royal seal on it and all this sort of stuff from Sir Robin Mackworth Young saying, uh, should the society approve of my idea of donating, offering the paintings to Her Majesty the Queen, Her Majesty the Queen has directed that she would be delighted to receive them. Well, needless to say, you can imagine as the member of a fairly impoverished art organization going in and here was like a totally unexpected solution to this really embarrassing issue because the society was thinking of having to return all those 60, each of those 60 paintings to the artists. And I said, no, they can go to Windsor Castle. And not only that, they're gonna be there in perpetuity in the Royal Collection. And it took off from there. People were calling me, well, can I still add a piece? You know, they, I hadn't put one in because I thought it was gonna to go to North Bay or something, you know? Um, do you know, interest, interestingly, several people wanted to pull their paintings out. I wanted to ask you that, Tony, if, if people were anticipating selling their painting and then the fact that they'd be donating it. Well, no, they were donating it right at the very beginning. That was the one thing well, they when were, they were first year, yeah, they knew they were donating it. So I think the society even gave them a dollar, you know, each for the painting. So they legally had title to it. But no, some people said, well, why should I donate it to one of the richest women in the world? You know, um, there was also the political consideration. I'm sure a couple of, I think one of them has Irish blood and they didn't want, you know, my granny would be rolling over in her grave if they knew that I was giving something to the Windsors or anything. Um, but of course it was, you know, Ultimately, what happened, they did go over in 1980. So right in time for the 60th anniversary, they, um, now I can't take credit for this. Somebody, you know, one of the higher ups in the executive of our group had some connections with the Ontario government. They knew there was a legation opening in London and also in Paris. And I can't think of his name. He was the guy, member of parliament from Scarborough at the time, who was the minister of education, uh, who became the first uh, representative in London. And Adrian Clarkson went to Paris. Uh, that's where she started off that, her career in that area. Anyway, uh, so the paintings were taken to um, Ontario House on King Charles Place in London. The president of the society flew over for the presentation and the royal librarian who I'd never dealt with, uh, Oliver Everett came down to receive them. And um, then, and, and I followed up with subsequent conversations with them. Oliver was coming here uh, with several collections that were loaned to the AGO. So we met up and chatted and he said they were so impressed with the 60, 60 watercolors. Oh, and I should mention that the 60 paintings didn't just go from Canada House, or Ontario House to Windsor Castle. They went to Windsor Castle and went up on display in the Queen's Gallery for 14 months. Yeah. And uh, that's the gallery right near the Doll's House. So now they didn't have all 60, but I do have an absolutely charming little story because my parent, my mother used to go over and visit her family. And I had a stepfather by this time, my dad had died. And my mother knew what was gonna happen. She knew that I had a paint, my painting was up hanging in Windsor Castle on display. It wasn't hanging, they were in glass display cases. So she knew that my aunt would want to go over to Windsor Castle, which was not terribly far away. And it was my aunt's way of showing that England was better than Canada. You know, that's the message. It was always Canada doesn't have anything like this. So the aunt would take us all out to all these historic places. And my mother for once kept quiet and she and my stepfather walk into the gallery and my mom could see as they were looking at the art. My aunt wasn't, but my mom could see my painting coming up. And my, my aunt said, is that 
a painting by Tony. And my mother just turned around and she said, oh, isn't that nice, you know, and played it all down as if, you know, but anyway, it was sort of a, an immigrant's a revenge sort of moment. But yeah, so the paintings went there anyway. And then what happened in, uh, I was asked by Oliver if he, or he just gave me permission. He just said, you know, you can expand this. We could do, why don't we aim for a hundred? So for the 75th anniversary of the society, another 15 paintings went over. And that is when the project really entered sort of a legendary status. Imagine, you know, um, Linda, if, is she, Linda, do you want to come up here at this point? Because Linda, at this point, is a member of the Watercolor Society. She submitted a work to the jurying for the 15 works that were going to go to the Royal Collection in 2000. And I should admit, say, it was an incredibly, we, in, we were so scrupulous in making sure there was no favoritism. I had more than 15 friends in the society, you know, so there was, I know where I was going, but it was so fair that even the president of the time didn't make it through the jurying, uh, you know, um, and actually not one person on the executive of 2000 made it through. The jury was trying to be as impartial. They actually, the president was Neville Clark, if you know him a wonderful artist, does mostly figurative work. And a, Neville is a black guy and a lot of his subject matter of black women. And somebody submitted a portrait of a black woman and the, and the jury loved it, juried it in thinking it was Neville's too. And isn't that sort of cool because he's the president, but they juried Neville's out. <laughs> it submitted, you know, a non-black person and Jean Peterson got in with this incredible painting of a, of a black woman. Uh, so it was that fair. Um, this is year 2000, right? It was 2000. We had the, the opening of the unveiling of those 15 paintings took place at the Arts and Letters Club and the Dennis O'Connor Gallery. And then we flew over. I made sure I was included this time. I went over with the 15. Oh, well, there were only 13, I think, artists that actually went. Um, and the reception at this point was at Canada House. Um, and the art attaché who had opened the show at Ontario House, so some years later, she is now the art attaché at Canada House. And what was really quite wonderful, and I've been able to maintain contact with them, with her ever since, is that when I put her in touch with Oliver Everett way back, I didn't know this, I didn't know anything about their private life. I introduced them, so it turned out, and they ended up becoming a couple. So every Valentine's Day, I get a note from them thanking me, you know? So yeah, I, I know I can still call on them to ask for favors from time to time, you know? But there's just some wonderful little stories. But this is the big thing. We turned up for the opening at Canada House. M my buddy, the art attaché, I had said to her, is there any chance that we could get a royal to actually come and accept the paintings rather than you know, the librarian or something? And she said, no, that's not gonna happen because no high commissioner is gonna give up the chance of inviting a royal because inside the Commonwealth in London, they're very careful that Canada, Australia and New Zealand all get the same number of royal invitations that they can use. And I think it's three big ones a year. And I thought, okay, well, at least I've asked. And then Diana, the attache said to me, but you know, Prince Charles is an honorary member of your society. Why don't you ask him? And I, I've never been scared to hold him back, you know, hold back from asking questions. So I sent Prince Charles a letter, asked him if he could come to the opening. And he accepted. So what happened was I was the guest of the High Commissioner to be at Canada House for the opening, and Prince Charles was my guest. And at that the the repercussions were really really funny. And I I'm going back to that earlier story about my aunt. Um, she had in the interim period died, but her husband, who's a great favorite in the family, um, I invited him to be at the reception at Canada House. And he still had this residual thing about, you know, 
they're just coming from the colonies. They're not just lucky enough to be English people anymore. So what happened when the artists, where's Linda there? She could you get Linda Kemp up? Yeah, I'm right here. I, okay, you can jump in here. So you, what happened when <laughs> we were all outside, right? We all were. Yes, we were all, we were all waiting and, and it was all choreographed how we were to move and how we were to greet Prince Charles. And uh, it was- We were given was, lessons in curtsying. The girls were all taken off, yeah. Oh, well, yes, we were, we were well-schooled in what we could and couldn't do and how we should move and how Prince Charles would move around the room and um, what we were to do. It was, it was, it was marvelous, marvelous adventure. But uh, yeah. yes, and Tony's uncle was there and, and that was great fun. <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah, so what happened? The artists were all in a separate sort of holding area and all the guests and the paintings were in this great room overlooking Trafalgar Square. And then, uh, uh, you know, so Prince Charles arrived, walked through our area, and um, and then as he's arriving in, all the artists are being ushered into the exhibition space, and I started going in, and they stopped me going in, and I said, no, no, I'm part of that group, and I was held back, and they said, because this mount is standing there, he said, no, the prince is your guest, so you have to walk in with him. And so the doors closed and I could see my uncle across the room while the, the little while they were open. And then so a few minutes later, I'm introduced to Prince Charles and the high commissioner and everybody is there. And Neville is also up because Neville was the president. So there's just us behind the doors. And it was so much fun because we couldn't see anything, but we could hear through the doors, you know, the major domo going, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, you know, his Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales and party. And the doors opened. And as they opened, I'm standing next to Prince Charles, who always has a cup of tea in his hand, so he doesn't have to shake hands with anybody. And we start walking in and I look across and my uncle is absolutely gobsmacked. His chin is down on you know, his chest and everything. But it, what happened is, um, so we delivered, we got through going around. He was supposed to be there for 40 minutes. An hour and a half later, Prince Charles is still there. And he then invited, I'm summoned over and he invites all the artists to Highgrove to see his paintings a few days later. And the aides were, Linda, you can talk about this because it's what happened when we went to Highgrove. It, it was marvelous. And, and, uh, and as you mentioned, the artists were invited, but not our guests or families. If we had traveled with anybody, they were not invited. And so we met at Trafalgar Square and Prince Charles sent a coach for us. And it was just like a fairy tale. And, and we traveled up to High Grove and uh, we were given instructions no cameras. We had to leave our purses in the in the um, coach, and they looked underneath it with mirrors for for cameras or weapons or whatever. And we were escorted into the back door, just like if I was to walk into your house and and you go in the back door and you throw your co uh, your coat on the couch, which is what we did. So there were were what were there maybe eight or nine of us there at that well, point? that number, yeah. Yeah, about that many. And and Prince Charles had um, small paintings hanging salon style in his little back room, mud room, basically, where we were all gathered. And he walked in and, uh, of course, we had our greeting. And somebody said about all these small paintings on the wall. And he said, well, I've got a hell of a lot more. Do you want to see them? And, and that's how we started our tour. And, yeah. and he, we were in the boys' bedroom and in the bathroom together. And I, I, didn't was, hear, I didn't hear a word that was being said because I was so stunned that being in Prince Charles's bathroom with him. Yeah. <laughs> were, you, were you able to focus on the art? And was the art any no, good? No, I couldn't. I couldn't. Now, Tony and, and Neville, they remembered all the pieces and who painted them. Me, I was just dazzled, just absolutely dazzled. And he truly was beautiful and charming to us. He, he was so gracious and, 
and interested in what we had to say about painting and art and about brushes and about paint. And we had a wonderful, wonderful time with him. It was, it was really great, wasn't it, Tony? Oh, it was, it was, I mean, we ended up, the place we lingered the longest was in what I guess we could call his study or something, because there was a desk and a fireplace and he bought out his art supplies, showed us all his brushes and what he used. And there was like dialogue, like he uses, He'd been trained to work with flat brushes, I think. And, and when I, or yeah, were they round was, ones? Yeah, he was using round brushes and Windsor Newton paint. Yeah, so whatever he was using, I sent the other one. A, so I sent perhaps a flat brush when I, I bought a really good one that I would never buy for myself, but send it off to him as a thank you. But what was so remarkable was uh, because of my height, um, those of you who don't know me, I'm over six feet tall, so I'm used to blocking people. So I'm always very um, observant about being at the back. So people are all gathered around. Some people were sitting on the floor while he's showing, pulling out his supplies. I have my bum on his desk and the art historian in me took over because I looked down, the desk had been cleaned off. There was nothing personal, except they made a mistake with a photograph that they'd left out on the top of a bookcase. And I'll get to that, but on his desk were three little miniature paintings and I love miniatures. And there was one of Queen Victoria, one of Queen Alexandra and one of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And I recognize them all. The painter painted Queen Victoria. He was the court painter to Queen Victoria early in her reign. Very famous miniature water, uh, watercolor in one of those leather boxes that opens up and it just hangs in there like a jewel. The most amazing one was one of Queen Alexandra because she was one of the great collectors of Fabergé and her miniature, I don't know who it was by, but it was in a little frame made of jeweled water lilies and not water lilies, lilies of the valley. And all the lilies of the valleys were pearls. And I did shake the desk so I could see them move, you know, which is in French, they call that en tremblant and you see them all move. And, that was wonderful. And then there was the portrait of the Queen Mother, also in one of those cases. Absolutely beautiful when she was a little girl. And then I, it suddenly hit me. I'm looking at them as art history. And to him, it's granny and great granny. You know, it's like us having Aunt Mabel's photo on our desk. And yeah, and then the one that the attendants had missed up, there was a photograph of the English singer, she's black, very popular at the time. She's a dame um, singer. Angela Bassett? Maybe? No, but you're in that category. She sang the James Bond films. Mm -hmm. Whoever that, Shirley Bassey. Is that you said? Shirley, Shirley Bassey. Dame Shirley Bassey. And it's a picture of Dame Shirley Bassey hugging the two princes and it was, in, she had obviously sent it in as a gift, but it, somebody had taken it out of the package and put it up, I guess to bring to his attention, he had never seen it. And I suddenly looking at it and what, looking at the signature and one of the aides who's standing there came over and said, excuse me, and he turned it face down. They'd obviously done a very good job of cleaning up the house that we were in the city. Yeah, but the highlight was we, one of our group commented on Charles's paintings of skies while we were in the bathroom. There were some great questions. I think that's why we had such a great time with him. Um, they, they asked this question like, how did Prince Charles adjust to going into a different climatic zone when your whole color palette changes, especially working in skies? And he didn't really answer it. He looked and he said, that is a great question. And he walked out of the bathroom and said, follow me. And they all start going up so we're already at this point one floor up they go up yet another floor and then we notice the aides didn't go with us they and the secretaries and i stopped to let one of these secretaries go past she was a canadian from when uh, from calgary and i said no after you and she said no none of us are allowed on that floor and i thought so we didn't know what we were going to see but he took us in to prince harry's bedroom and now bear in mind this is 2000 Prince Harry was a little kid and it was a as a teacher it was when Charles became a human being to me because we looked at the paintings as one woman said these paintings are wonderful sir thinking they were by him by Charles 
And Charles said, no, these are by Harry. He's really gifted, but he won't apply himself. Mm-hmm. And I just, to me, it was like, I thought, oh my God, it's parents night, you know? So yeah. Um, but no, it was just, it was one of those amazing experiences. And I bring this up to everybody, not to be self-centered in any way. I think this is sort of one of those great little Canadian stories. It turned out no other group has ever been honored with a tour of the house. Even if you're a multi-millionaire donor to the Prince's Trust, you don't get invited into Highgrove. Uh, you'll get it there, you're entertained in another uh, building. But, you know, anyway, uh, but I bring it up because this could never have happened to any one of us uh, had we been just individual artists. It happened because we were involved with a society and the society was the being honored. Yeah, so. That's a great story. And, and I, I know you've mentioned that uh, with the Royal Collection, there's a new batch going over in 2025, is that right? Yes, there are. I'm just now starting, I've been lucky enough to hold on to this project. I mean, I was not stupid and gave it away to somebody else to look after. I thought this is too interesting a story. I, I should mention, I did put those 15 paintings under my bed as well. Uh, so um, at this point, I have a record of 75 paintings in the Royal Collection being under my bed at one point. And but these are unframed, I guess. These are- They these are, are, yeah, just all matted. They're just little quarter sheets. And that is interesting because the, they conf- the mats have to conform to a size of one of the stock sizes of the Royal Collection's frames. So they're exactly the same size as, for example, the mats around most of the Leonardo da Vinci drawings and things like that. And uh, anyway, so the 25 going over, they're going to be juried in 2024. Linda is going to be one of the jurors. The jurors are all going to be people already in the collection. There'll be no repeats, no, the 75 that are there are all by 75 different Canadian artists. A lot of them are now dead. Um, and um, yeah, I'm hoping I'm going to be around and we will bring it up to 20, bring it up to a total of 100. And so one of the big advantages of being a member of the Watercolor Society in the next three or four years is going to be the ability to take part in that jurying and perhaps be one of those artists lucky enough to get a work to go in there. And I think Linda can verify this. That has been the most wonderful bio entry to say, you know, collections, first line, the, the collection of Her Majesty the Queen, the Royal Collection Trust Windsor Castle. Yeah. And, uh, and I should point out to people, you know, it's really interesting. Artists as a group are not always the nicest people to their fellow artists, you know, like there are some jerks in our community. And I remember once, some years ago, being asked to talk about the Royal Collection project, because there some years ago there was a this is when the you know the 15 were being juried. There was a lot of interest even in the media about it. And I was speaking right on this grumpy old guy at some arts gathering said, Well, I've already got paintings in the Royal Collection. And I said, Well, how did you, you know, how did you get that? Um, how did you do that? And he said, Well, I just gave them as a gift. I mailed them to the Queen. And he said, I got a thank you letter, so I'm in the collection. Hmm. And I didn't, you know, respond in public, but I did speak to him afterwards. Uh, if you send a work and donate it to the royal family, they'll send you a thank you. And then it's donated, it goes into a big pile of stuff that's stored away. And when they're asked for donations to charity, it will be given out and sent off to charity. They've, the 75 paintings that are in Windsor Castle, and this is the big difference, have a Royal Collection Trust inventory number on them and you can actually go online and look at all of those individual works. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, so it, it's a, that is really, but I, you know, and I, I focused on the CSPWC because uh, I ended up becoming the president for a couple of years and um, that was where I work. Kim is working a lot, I know, with the OSA. Um, and Linda has been on the executive of the CSPWC. And I do think people uh, who are thinking of perhaps joining other societies, um, like the FCA and getting involved, is do get involved and, um, and look for a chance where you and your fellow artists can have some experience, you know, something akin to this. I mean, I, th- I think we hit, you know, 
gold when we got that letter back from the Royal Collection. That's not going to happen all the time, but there's loads of other opportunities, you know. So uh, one thing, theme I'd like to touch on is something that we're trying to do as a group is finding ways to exhibit, places to exhibit in the province. And I know in the Arabella article when you were describing your, your early experience with the Watercolor Society and this Royal Collection, the, I, think, I think in the article it said that the, the uh, galleries wanted to be able to curate their own shows and then there's something about each work had to ha come with a cash endowment. Oh yeah. And I'm not sure what that meant exactly at that time. Okay, so what happened was, you know, these are the gallery, those were not commercial galleries, they were public galleries. The, the ones I approached asking if they would, you know, consider housing the collection. And so, as I mentioned, we got rebuffed by them all. Um, but one or two people from various places, one of them, was, I think it was the, I shouldn't say definitely, but I have a feeling it was the Agnes Etherington down in Kingston. Their response was that storing artwork is expensive. You can't just have, you know, get a, a work and put it in, a, in storage. You have to factor in the cost of keeping that work and keeping it in good condition. And um, so they actually, if it was them, but was one group definitely did ask that if we were going to accept the paintings, each painting would have to have a cash endowment along with it from presumably the artist that it would look after it into the future. And so I actually put this in a more meaningful response, assuming that nearly everybody here is from the Toronto area. In the city of Toronto, if you want to donate a sculpture to the city of Toronto, you not only have to pay for the installation, the, you know, the incredible expense of putting in foundations or whatever it is that support it, you also have to write, underwrite the care and conservation of that for the next century. Uh, otherwise they will not accept it. And Tony, I've heard that's true too, of people wanting to donate artwork from their private collection to let's say the AGO, it has to be uh, examined to make sure it's not gonna fall apart and then there yes, has to definitely. be some way of funding it. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and there's, uh, Linda and I had a conversation about this, how these collections can build up so quickly. Um, the CSPWC is now where they've got a diploma collection and it's suddenly, you know, become 400 pieces. And, you know, it's a bit of a handicap in, from my view. Um, what do you do with these? You know, they're all, these ideas are started with very good intentions. But um, no, I... Uh, you know, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there, but. Uh, well, let, let me jump, jump in. And one group we haven't talked about is the Arts and Letters Club and its extensive art collection as well. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's a, in a different bracket, I'm, yeah. in a way, because it's, they're not major masterpieces, they're really things, they're more personal. You know, so that, as somebody once described, the, art, the Arts and Letters Club collection is, mementos of famous past members and things like that. I mean, yeah, I don't, uh, because they did have a couple of really good paintings. They had a Lauren Harris, which they sold and paid off. They sold it to pay off half their mortgage or something on the building. But uh, yeah, there is, there, yes, I'm still trying to, sorry, I'm trying to recapture my thought on that previous thing. Sorry, please throw a question out or are we exhausting the time? We're, I guess we'll, we'll go for a few more minutes. Um, okay. And I, I know we're, we're going to have another uh, evening when we uh, talk about some of your work for the Houses of Parliament project, which I think is important and people should yeah. hear about it. Um, Do you know, we, Andy, sorry. I was going to say, we've oh, done a good yeah. review of the art societies and, and the benefits of, of joining. And I know, as I look now to the states and the major art societies they have there, one of the benefits of joining those groups is that the commercial galleries will look towards um, the, the, the group shows, the group exhibitions to see up and coming artists and collections of work that they'd like to borrow for their own commercial galleries to mount shows. Do mm -hmm. you get a sense of that happening uh, up here in Canada as well as one of the, one of the functions of an art society? I, I don't think the big galleries 
go to any of the society shows. Um, I mean, they're, the one thing that we have, exp I, I can say it's a, with Kim and our gang, the Pords, when we have exhibited in the past at the Aired Gallery, certainly the provincial archives came in and they purchased one of Heidi's paintings, didn't they, Kim, for uh, that. So yeah, they, as a collection, uh, that was really quite wonderful. Um, but no, I don't think they, they really do. Um, do you know, one of the problems with society shows too, and I, I do have this underlined down here is, I think a lot of people think that they're gonna be a venue to sell work. And most societies for their shows accept one work by any one artist. And I know as a person buying art, I would never go to a society show really to buy art where you've got one example of a person whose work you might like. I mean, if it's somebody you've really followed and then you happen to see a great piece by them. But for the most part, if you're gonna buy art or sell art, you wanna have a comparison with some other pieces. So, I mean, they're not the best venues. I think that's what makes commercial galleries a much better venue because you've got a whole body of work to choose from. You know. But I imagine with the future of commercial galleries being somewhat uncertain, for obvious reasons. Somewhat, yeah. Then I, I'm hoping that art societies will be even more important as, as, a, as an avenue for artists to get their work seen at least. Yeah, and the, but the, the other thing too is, and I think this is important because I've, I've focused, I, please forgive me those of you who don't touch watercolors, but there is a, a very, well, two things I wanted to touch on. The, um, Watercolors are totally out of fashion right now. You can hardly sell a watercolor, um, you know, even by a name artist at this point. Um, in the auction houses, really, I just bought a really famous artist. Fred Brigden was the first president of the CSPWC. He was the Dean of Canadian watercolor painting in the 1920s. Um, I beautifully framed the painting I bought was a quite large painting when I, went down there and I was looking at it, the guy who's responsible for paintings at Waddington's said he thought it was the best uh, painting by the artist that had come in by Brigden in 25 years. It wasn't faded, it was Canadian, farm scene, had cattle in it, you know, and a really lovely painting. Uh, the opening bid was $300 and I got it for $300. Nobody bid against me for it. And he was like the most famous watercolorist in the country in 1925, you know. And, um, and I know the Roberts Gallery uh, is, you know, per, the, you know, it's probably, you know, the most significant, in terms of history, most significant gallery in the city. It will not take watercolors at this point at all. They just do not sell. And I think there's just, uh, that's one thing that artists perhaps don't understand is there are cycles in everything. I can remember where you couldn't sell abstract art. Rita Latonde, I remember, you know, who did those great stripes. They look like lines of perspective going off. She was a darling of the abstract art world in the 50s and 60s. And then I know somebody, a friend of mine, she was looking for a painting for a staircase and about 20 years ago, we saw this enormous Rita Latonde. It was about 15 feet long. And I said, that would be great in your hallway. She said, my hallway's not, I said, your hallway's more than 15 feet tall. We hung it on its side. She got it for 150 bucks. That painting would be worth 20 or 30,000 now. So Rita Latonde is back in fashion in a big way right now. You know, so yeah, you, that is just a reality of the art market, you know, and the art world and, you know, consumer tastes, yeah, so. Well, Tony, let me open up the floor to anyone else who'd like to ask some questions uh, before we wrap up. Okay. Uh, if you have a question, just feel free to unmute yourself. And, and if there's more than one of you speaking at the same time, just drop your questions in the, in the chat window and I'll make sure that you're, that you're seen, so. If anyone would like to ask a question, please go ahead. I always have questions. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for wonderful stories. Uh, I really enjoy them. Um, what do you think is the future in general? Uh, uh, you as a historian, 
when you look at art, where are we now and where are we going? Oh my God, I, I really could, I could not tell you because I am, and, and my painting buddies will tell you this, like I'm such a traditionalist. Um, the art I admire in the 19th century of the academics, I'm one of those people that goes and explores 19th century memorials and bronze monuments, those things that decorate great public spaces. I love, you know, all the skills that went into that. I am so out of touch with the modern world and, you know, um, I honestly don't know. There's, I think between my painting buddies in the ports and Linda, who gets out into the art community a lot more than I did, do you have any answers to this, either of you ladies? Because I definitely don't know what's going on. Well, I would certainly uh, say, as, as you've mentioned, Tony, about the... Um, changes in trends and that things do come around again and and I um, am, am very fortunate to do a lot of jurying and these days what I am seeing coming into the shows um, and, and I do judge a lot of them is high realist stuff is really really in right now as well as um, plein air work but it's outdoors uh, or it's, it's, it's still high realist, even though it's outdoors, it's still high realism is the big trend right now. That's, wow. that's what's coming in. I just, um, I jured the International Women in Watercolor show. We had 1200 entries and one of the categories was abstract work. We probably had out of 1200 pieces, maybe five that came close to even qualifying as abstract out of 1200 pieces. That's, that's what was, ha that's what I'm seeing right now. So that's really, okay, sorry, Kim, did you have something? Or, no, what's really interesting, I think about that is, I can remember when I was with Bill Stadnick at Cambridge, um, the big exhibition at the Fitzwilliam Museum uh, in those years was that fabulous exhibition that had been touring the world on the Wyeths. Yes. Remember that? There was the three generations of the Wyeth family. And that was the tail end of that last wave of high realism. And then that went really out. So that was the mid 80s. So that's 15, that's 30, 35 years later. So it's, that's interesting. So that's back. Yeah, Absol absolutely. That's, that's what I'm seeing. And there's a huge push for it right now. And I would wow. say it's, it's also, uh, it's been back in the last 20 years with the uh, development of uh, of ateliers, of traditional art training, correct, correct, training, and yeah. so many people are graduating from those schools yeah. and, and yeah. introducing their work as well. So I think that partly accounts for a return to representational art. Well, Kim, did you want to say something? I was going to ask you to unmute if you wanted to jump in. I I think people are. Um, experimenting with things that they can do with digital art. I think, you know, com also combining art, people doing painted sculpture, people doing um, altering photography, people creating installation and combining it with dance. And I think, you know, um, art that is um, sort of more, ex I see things that are more experimental I think there are people, you know, young people coming out of art school are kind of pushing, pushing the edges, you know, defining art in so many different ways too. Yes, certainly with sweeping changes in digital art, there's so many more possibilities yeah. and, and, and even 3D printing of, of objects as well and, and experiments with new, new materials, that's certainly true. Yeah. I think that's part of what's happening. Well, everyone, we're getting close to nine o'clock. Or Irina, would you like to uh, jump yeah, in? Yeah, I just want to follow up with that um, comment about abstract art that only five uh, pieces were submitted. How would you explain? Because my, uh, from what I see, there's a lot of uh, abstract painters. Is it decreasing or just... Um, 
the way art uh, abstract work is juried has been changed. What's the expectation then for abstract work? Right. Well, in, in the particular um, exhibition that I'm speaking about, the, the people that would enter their work, they were allowed to submit work to, to five different categories, of which one of them was abstract. So we had a number of, we had more people submit to the abstract uh, category than five. But really, when I looked at them, I would have only classified them, five of them as being abstract. Um, and uh, that that's really what I'm saying. Um, and and a lot of it has to do right now. And of course, I'm, I'm looking mostly at um, two dimensional work. That's that's my area of expertise. And that's where I'm asked to judge. But um, there are certainly popular instructors, and they have a huge impact on the student work. And so that influences what's coming in. And um, that's, that's part of the trend that I see. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Kim, I know you've curated uh, or chaired a number of OSA ex exhibitions in recent years. Have you seen uh, any trends in terms of, uh, let's say, the proportion of abstract work to to photography or digital work or traditional uh, media? I just, I mean, in the in a, in the long term, the OSA started out as a painting society, and now we have members who are sculptors, people who do digital photography, people who are do, creating work on collage with people who are doing installation, people doing experimental pieces, you know, people doing video and submitting it for an, an OSA exhibition. So I think in that sense, you know, the, it, there's a much broader definition of the kinds of things we see. I, I don't know whether it'll move along that way or um, there'll be room for, you know, more traditional work as well. I know our particular organization, the FCA's, uh, uh, prohibits uh, prints and digital art and photography. I guess the focus is on more traditional media. For some people, that's been quite a mistake or, or uh, a barrier to entry that they resent. I don't know how, how you and Linda and Tony would feel about that choice that the FCA the head office in Vancouver has made. Yeah. They are admitting sculpture. That's something that's brand new. They, yeah. They're bringing the Sculpture Society back into the FCA out in uh, British Columbia. But if you look at um, things like the art project, people who rent a booth and go down there, you see these giant, giant photographs that have all been digitally, you know, manipulated huge photographs, maybe three by five people, you know, who are, who could never have created that kind of thing in a dark room or have expanded the, the media. I guess that's what I'm saying, you know, sort of pushing the edge, trying to find new ways to um, represent, you know, their own work. You know, in light of this conversation and the, and the question of what's coming up, the Arts and Letters Club has next three um, opening in a couple of weeks. And um, just give you a bit of background. Um, this is, so it's the third next show. Next, the first one was about eight years ago. Um, and there was a incredible amount of entries because it was just the pro anybody in the province was in but they were offering the first prize was five thousand dollars and I think there was a purse of twenty five thousand dollars in prizes uh, the award winners were fairly conventional pieces then there was next two which was a continuation of the same thing but um, and the arts and letters club wanted this in the pre-covid period to become a regular biennial, triennial show. And a, a, a much younger crowd have taken over the whole concept and they've committed themselves to looking after it for the next four or five iterations of the show. 
which is remarkable because it means then you get some consistency and stuff like that. The top, the first prize this year is $10,000. Um, and they've got it open. So it's a, a very attractive purse. Um, and that's you know, one prize. There, uh, um, there were all sorts of categories, including media, uh, sculpture, writing. Um, and they're going to be up even during uh, the artists have to deliver the work the week of the 13th. Uh, no, yes. Anyway, it's this not this week, but the week next. It's they have to coming up. Yeah. Yeah. They have to get the work down there. And, in my, and Heidi uh, Burkhardt, who's part of our group, got a number of pieces in. I was very lucky. I got two large canvases in, but I have no idea what the other works are going to be like, uh, but it's going to, I'm just mentioning it because I think it would be interesting you, to go on and see what they have selected, what wins. Um, they're going to have online um, exhibitions and openings and people will be able to go down, I gather, they are hoping in small groups of five or six and walk through the real show and see it in reality. But it's, I think it would be a good guide to perhaps what another gen no from my perspective another generation is thinking yeah. that's true well folks i think i'm going to wrap it up now we're at nine o'clock um okay. tony linda kim Thanks, uh, thank you for joining us yes yeah. thank you for inviting me yes me too we're going to do this again and, thanks tony uh, oh, thank, thank you, you very much and uh, I guess I'll, I'll uh, say good night, everybody. And good night. we'll be doing this in two weeks' time again. So thank, thank you for, you for surviving.